Um, Mr. President and ladies and gentlemen, um, I was told um, by the committee that I could speak for three or four hours. Um, <laughs> so as an emeritus professor, of course, I grabbed that with both hands. Um, but I'll try and finish uh, a little bit quicker than that. Um, my talk is going to be, this title seems a little bit broad and strange. Climate change, well, we all roughly know what that's about. Storms, floods, uncertainty I'm going to talk about, and our human being reaction to all of this. I'm a civil engineer, and I've worked on this topic all my life. Really, um, I've worked on flood forecasting systems, uh, large dams, um, and uh, this is real-time mathematics, so I pinched mathematics from control engineers, which is really the, the area that electrical engineers traditionally used to dominate in. Um, and I've actually built radars, um, five of them, in fact, in my own life, which is a rather strange thing for a civil engineer to do. So I'm a slightly old-fashioned engineer in that I'm not too embarrassed to get a screwdriver out and do something uh, with it. Now, I want to try and uh, go through this topic of climate change from a slightly different uh, perspective. And uh, that's what Andrew, I think, encouraged me to do. So let's have a look at the first picture. Um, I was a professor for quite a long time at Bristol. Um, I was in the civil engineering department. Um, and not long after I arrived in 97, I was interviewed um, by a newspaper on the telephone. And uh, I thought they were wonderful people and very nice. And they asked me lots of uh, interesting questions and I gave them answers. And the weekend newspaper had this picture in it. And the picture, if you notice, has uh, Cardiff underwater. Uh, Bristol is also flooded. The Somerset levels have disappeared. Um, Newport is gone and Gloucester's underwater. And I was famous when I went back to work on the Monday morning. Um, the problem for anyone working in climate change is what can be made of it by the media. And in many ways, it's our own fault. It's the fault of scientists, it's the fault of engineers um, and mathematicians, all the people that work on climate prediction, um, for not being able to be certain and clear at the present time. And partially failing, I think, at uh, getting over the issue of uncertainty, how difficult it actually is, and that it's going to take us quite a long time to sort this out. It's not something we're going to sort out uh, necessarily within one lifetime. It may be several generations when we're tackling this problem, um, and I discovered that quite early on. I actually knew it before this newspaper was published, uh, the Bristol Evening Post in 1999. But I never really lived it down at Bristol after that. I was the number one person to come to for a good story on climate. And I would run and hide under my desk and pretend I wasn't there. Now, you've all become aware of the energy budget. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But uh, we have incoming uh, energy uh, uh, from the sun. And it radiates off our planet. So not all of it stays down here. Um, we have a cloud system. Um, but basically, some of it stays down here and is held in um, within our atmosphere, hence the so-called greenhouse effect. So, and if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be living on our planet. So it's great news. The problem for us is, of course, is that we could and can and probably are doing things to uh, make our planet uh, warmer. And that, with it, brings consequences. Now, I'm going to talk about that as an engineer. Uh, which you won't have seen in the newspapers very much, and you won't necessarily be aware about what I think I can do about this problem as an engineer and what uncertainties exist. So that we can't change other than the fact that we can actually um, modify it, if you like, by what we've done. And for many years, in fact, uh, we've actually argued about whether we are or are not modifying it. This is a picture. I've not taken this from IPCC. You've seen that on the television, the International Panel on Climate uh, Change, of which there are very few engineers actually involved, I would say. Very, very few. Um, count them on very few fingers on one hand. Um, this is a picture which they've pinched, this newspaper, which is a good newspaper in Louisiana. And uh, they put up what is uh, one of the standard pictures of temperature going up. 
um, coldest year, 1909. Um, this dates back to 2014. The hottest year was 2014 now, but the hottest year was last year. Um, you've got to remember that if you read some history books, you find that back in the um, 1700s, we had a mini ice age. The river Thames froze. We had annual frost fairs, annual frost fairs for some years. That means seriously deep ice, people building bonfires on the ice, many thousands of people walking on the ice. It's nothing at all to do with the industrial age because it had hardly started. The fact remains that what we have in our atmosphere is a lot of variability. And we've always had that, and we've recognized it. Now, there's two key words, I think, on the hydrology side, and I've worked in the area of hydrology and water resources most of my life. The word is stationary, which means things don't change with time, or non-stationary. As a young civil engineer, I knew about this 40 years ago. There's nothing new to me uh, about the fact that hydrology can throw up huge extremes, uh, and we have to deal with them. Now, most of the extremes I'm going to talk about are floods tonight, but I could have given almost the same lecture on drought. And for drought, we have no water, you're dead. Uh, the first equation I used to teach young civil engineers was water equals life. Simple equation, but it's very true. Um, a few years ago, I did um, a secret uh, presentation, if I can call it that. It was invitation only. And it was on the problem of drought variation and the likelihood that in certain parts of the world that could induce conflict. And you, you appreciate why it was secret. Um, but there are a number of areas where um, many people expect that the next serious outbreak of war, conflict, will be over water. Um, and it's not too difficult to guess where some of those places are. Let's have a look at this data, though. Um, often this is an IPCC graph. Now, I'm not going to knock the IPCC. They're doing great work, but we need to interpret what they're doing. Um, from roughly our period, 2000, they predict um, the consequences of a number of different scenarios. And these are socioeconomic scenarios. One is low growth, moderate growth, high growth. I, are we going to get more people, the growing population, uh, more industrialization, different aspects of these assumptions? And you notice as we go forward in time, you get uh, increasing uncertainty. Uh, this is natural about prediction. Uh, quite close to an event, uh, we're able to predict. A long way ahead, our ability to predict becomes less uh, good, less satisfactory, and more problematic. The scatter around these predictions can be vast. Now, that's where IPC tend to stop. They present that data as, as scientists, and then they leave the politicians and the engineers and the rest of us at that point. And I'm going to take you a little bit beyond that point. Before I do, I want to show you this one. This is a proxy reconstruction of climate, paleoclimate. This goes back a 1,000 years. A uh, thousand years ago, we had the Norman invasion, and just before that, the foundation of modern England when uh, King Alfred and his merry men beat the Vikings. This is the sort of period that we're talking about. And on average, over that whole time, the world has been about a degree lower than what we consider to be the norm at the moment. Has IPCC shown that the world as a whole is getting hotter? Not really because the world isn't getting hotter, bits of the world are getting hotter. Equally, bits of the world are getting colder. And these are the forecasts that IPCC have produced for the governments uh, as a consequence of United Nations backing and funding. Now, I want to talk about some of the consequences of this. How do we get this data? Well, the same way you get this data. Where we are now, we're approximately 10,000 years from the end of the last ice age. That ice age lasted something like 80,000 years. There were time within that, times in fact, within that ice age where temperature varied dramatically, dramatically, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten degrees for a variety of reasons. Uh, volcanoes didn't stop being volcanoes. Dust clouds didn't stop going up. Um, all of these issues were going on, and no matter what the human beings were doing, and we were there through most of these um, ice ages, we go back longer than all of them on that record. How do they know this? Well, you drill a hole in sediments, 
and you analyze the sediments in terms of trapped gas um, and other chemistry. And the same, same in ice cores, drill a hole in ice. The snow that has fallen historically gets squashed and the ice builds up. Where do you get ice that deep? Well, Antarctica, Greenland. And you drill a very long hole uh, through the ice and you can see these ice ages. And they replicate pretty much whether you're looking at ice or deep sea cores. So we know that we have these constant um, sort of shifts in climate, which without going into detail now, has uh, probably been due to wobbling on the Earth axis, but I don't want to go near that one tonight. We have variations on our planet, come what may, no matter what human beings have done. And were one of those changes to occur now, we would have problems to deal with, and they would be big problems to deal with. Uh, we wouldn't be living in our country if we had another ice age. We'd be living down, if we were lucky, in North Africa, or if we were unlucky, um, in the southern coast of the Iberian Peninsula, if they'd have us. So the reality is we live in a very interesting planet that has this amazing variability. What have we done? Well, we pumped carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, fossil fuels, land use changes, cutting down our forests, burning wood, methane. We have lots of cows, which are wonderful producers of methane, but not the only source. Um, from the second eating, the regurgitation um, of a cow, uh, lots of methane comes out. Um, nitrous oxide, cars, combustion, they're in the atmosphere. Even if we did everything right now, some of these things are going to be around for 100 years, 150 years, some of them 10 years, 20 years. And these are not precise figures. It entirely depends on complex chemistry, atmospheric chemistry, which will uh, control whether aerosols are up two weeks or a bit longer. So you have this huge variability, and most of the concentration has been on carbon dioxide, CO2. Um, and that is generally what you hear um, within uh, the IPC community as they have their various meetings every few years. This is a picture I show a lot. It's from the Sunday Times magazine. For those of you who read the Sunday Times, you might actually remember it, uh, 2007. And what they did was said, OK, we know what Britain looks like on a digital terrain map. Uh, let's melt the Greenland ice sheet if it gets hotter and all the ice melts. It's on land, on top of Greenland. If it melts, there's nowhere for it to go but the sea. Therefore, the sea will get deeper. So any ice you melt on land will cause ocean depth to increase, quite apart from if it gets hotter and the ocean will expand a little bit. And that is the two main causes of our ocean depth. If we melt the Greenland ice sheet, the Met Office have estimated about seven meters. Seven meters, our country becomes a wonderful uh, archipelago of islands. My hobby is sailing. I think that is a wonderful picture. Now, the point I'm making is that the hazard we face as a world community is not necessarily the same risk for all of us. Uh, you can actually make an argument that it's wonderful for Britain, as long as you look after the water supplies of the East Coast. Um, other parts of the world are in dire circumstances if certain things go wrong, with too much water, floods, or too little water, droughts. And no water means you're dead. It's that simple. It means you're dead. Um, and that, of course, is the threat uh, behind uh, instability that people are worried about uh, in the context of war and violence. If people have no water, they're going to move. And no human being is going to stay in one place and die. So these sorts of variabilities are going to be a big issue for us. This is from a newspaper again. The data is from NOAA. That's the big uh, atmospheric organization uh, in the United States. NOAA um, owns the National Weather Service as one of their agencies and so on. Now, this newspaper uh, basically put it into terms that could be understood by its readership, and it's reasonably good. Um, what it said is that uh, a 50-year event um, is going to probably become a 30-year event in that little part of America where that newspaper was published. I haven't even written down where that is. Somewhere near, somewhere near the Gulf. The amount of rain is going to go up about 10% there. Now, the reality is you can do studies all over the planet at the moment, and you can find that you will get these sorts of figures, or worse, occurring in certain locations. Nothing whatsoever showing the data records elsewhere and the opposite happening in other places. 
The variability around the geographic uh, sphere is, is quite a lot, and that has got to be recognized as part of the problem on the predictability front uh, for IPCC and in all the other agencies that take their data and have to deal with it. But in general, we're expecting uh, a lot of variation. Now, I'm going to put a picture up which is uh, very much an engineering slide with so some words. If I'm going to design a dam to store water for water supply, or store water to protect people downstream from flooding, um, or any kind of sluices or embankments or huge pumps, whatever. First of all, pipes in our urban areas, huge pipes that you can drive buses through. This is very, very expensive infrastructure. Most of us nowadays live in cities. Most of the developed world live in cities. And you don't see underground what infrastructure is there. And you don't necessarily know or care or worry about how much it costs. It's just there. It costs trillions. China has rebuilt its cities and developed its cities over the last two and a bit decades. Total transformation. The design standards were what were accepted by Chinese engineers as a natural part of their business and their duty uh, two decades ago before we started getting serious about conversations about climate change. Um, what is the frequency of storms doing and where? Well, in parts of China, it's going to go up. It is going up. In Britain, it's going to go up. In most of Britain, in fact. The intensity. Are we going to get more intense storms? Well, yes. And I'll, if you bear with me, I'll tell you why. Are the storms likely to be larger or smaller? The spatial extent. Well, that will vary depending on how this rain is generated around the globe. If you're an Indian citizen, you'll be getting rained on by a um, type of weather um, that is quite different from the type of weather that you get rained on in Great Britain. Most of our rain will be driven by, essentially, oceanic influence of the Atlantic Ocean, occasionally, occasionally um, by storm systems that are generated by the continental landmass. If you're a continental country like Poland, uh, you're going to be suffering a much more complex system of causal factors for generating rain. The duration of a storm, are they going to last longer? Are they going to be worse? The timing, are they short, short, sharp storms? Are they bigger and worse? Now, any of these changes can, in fact, uh, result in unprecedented extreme weather and climate events. <laughs> Our problem as engineers and scientists at the moment is directly attributing some of the climate things that we think are changing in our models and our fundamental knowledge of the physics, the atmospheric science side of our equation, and the consequence in terms of a flood or a drought, and saying this was due to climate change, when it could be due to something other, i.e. normal life on the planet, and you've had an extreme event. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to separate some of these things out. So this problem of direct attribution, unfortunately, is there, isn't going to go away. And it's very difficult for people like me to stand up in front of an audience, unless they're retired and not dependent upon a wage, um, to actually say that to you. Because there is very much a climate change industry that drives and pressurizes um, sometimes decisions before we're really ready to make them. And in many of these events and these issues, I'm not ready to make them. I know that they're problematic because of spending my whole life thinking about them. Uh, and I'm not thick. The problem is this. For those of you who are older than me, because I wasn't old, uh, alive in 1947, it's called the Great Flood. What was it? Well, we had rain onto snow on the ground, great snowstorms had happened, and the ground was frozen. So there's nowhere for the rain runoff to go. The, the rain was warm, because it was liquid. It melted the snow. It couldn't go into the ground. It ran off, and we had incredible flooding around our country in 1947, the UK. I could pick Chinese stories. I could pick American stories. There are special events that have been outstanding flood-generating events around the globe. We had Linmouth, for those of you around in 52. I was three years old. 
It was a flash flood. Horrendous. Why did it happen? Well, a big storm cell happened across a sensitive catchment. If it had gone to the left or the right, you would not have had the Lynmouth flood. But it hit a sensitive catchment and produced a horrendous flash flood that washed away part of this beautiful little town in Devon. We had the North Sea storm surge one year later where we killed a few hundred people in Britain, a few thousand people in the Netherlands. You will find no conversation at the time about climate change because that wasn't on our radar in the 50s. We hadn't realized what we were up to in terms of changing climate. And initially, when people raised the issue of climate change, um, people didn't really believe it. It couldn't be us. It wasn't me, Gov. Uh, we can't possibly do that. Uh, I don't believe personally that now. I think we have done it. We are doing it. Um, and uh, we're going to have some difficulty with it. But not everybody will have the same degree of difficulty around the planet uh, due to this problem. The Easter floods of 98 were about once in 150 years. They were quite scary. Uh, the autumn floods, which happened a couple of years later, once in 100 years. Now, it's the numbers I'm going to come back to in a minute. Boss Castle, for those of you who remember it on television, helicopters rescuing people off rooftops um, due to the Boss Castle storm. Why did it happen? Well, the air that came in that day to the highest cliffs in North Devon was essentially tropical rain, uh, a tropical air, laden with moisture. If you stood on the cliff in a T-shirt, you would have been damp without moving um, because it was laden with moisture. And then it had to lift itself up over the cliffs. And there's one hill place there, a small hill, where the rain started and fed off uh, downwind. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, had it happened before? Yes. About barely 100 years before. And barely 100 years before that, it had happened. It's always happened there because of that circumstance. All you need is the combination of incredibly heavy moisture in air mass. Make the air mass lift. Um, I could have shown you some wonderful big equations um, to do with numerical modeling of the atmosphere. The most difficult equations to deal with are the rainfall bits. The mathematics is diabolical, um, and the physics is actually quite challenging. And the space-time aspects that you can model on, what scale in space and what scale in time, is problematic. It used to be we could not model, for many, many years, thunderstorms. And um, you had research groups in the UK taking lead position on this, of developing mathematical models of large thunderstorms on supercomputers when they first started to appear. Now we expect that modeling to actually be encompassed within a Met Office model that runs on a supercomputer, but also models almost the whole world, or a chunk of the Atlantic Ocean showing weather coming in to the UK. Now, these are the things engineers design for. We design things on the basis of some risk factor. We use this phrase return period, something that says, well, something is going to come on average once every 100 years. That's quite rare. And that will govern how much money we spend. Why once in 100 years, or sometimes inside a city once in 30 years, or once in five years? Why? Well, we limit it because of cost. We could design everything to once in 10,000 years. And we have the most expensive uh, infrastructure on the whole planet, and it would be vast in size and scale. But it's illogical, and we can't afford it. So we decide a risk level to design for. Unfortunately, if everything is changing, those risk levels for us are coming, they're becoming more problematic. The frequency is probably going uh, down. 50 years is becoming 30 years. The 100 years is becoming 80 years. What do you do? Do you go out and design everything again and rebuild it? Rebuild all the pipes, the dams, the spillways? One third of the cost of a big dam is typically a spillway. The spillway is designed, on average, in Britain for once in 10,000 years, crudely. It's roughly once in 10,000 years. Why? Because if the dam falls down, it will kill a lot of people downstream. 
because almost everywhere in Britain, uh, below a dam, you have human beings living in urban areas. Almost all the high dams in Britain, in secret, I've done the dam break work for. Some of those dams at various times have nearly fallen down for a variety of reasons, accidents, mishap, whatever. The government has, in fact, carried out all sorts of secret calculations done at the time you have a mishap, uh, ready to get people out from the path of a, a dam. Typically, a dam break analysis is immediately instigated, and engineering work is, is done to try and stop a dam falling down. And at some point, when you think it's going to go, everyone is shifted out. No one has been shifted out in Britain this century. The last dam to fall down and kill people was Sheffield in Britain uh, last century but one, 1880-ish, 1870-ish. But we have had some other dams fall down that didn't kill anyone. And we've had some notorious accidents that you didn't know about because uh, they were not published. They were protected by security legislation. Now, extreme rainfall prognosis, why? Warmer temperature increases the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. You can hold more water. Raindrops are bigger. Roughly, for every degree Celsius, you get 6 or 7% more water in the atmosphere. That's crude number, but it's reasonably close to what happens. There is little, if no evidence, of significant change in global annual mean. So if you're looking at the average around the whole planet, you're not going to see a big change. But you will see it in certain parts of the world. Yes, our country is one of them, and yes, China is another. Um, and uh, I've got huge connections with China and have for 30 years uh, in the flood domain on big dams and uh, uh, now cities. Heavy rainfall is getting more intense and more frequent. Can we say it is climate change or is it just normal? It doesn't really matter. It's getting worse. But if it's a non-stationary effect, time-dependent effect, then we're talking about climate change. If it isn't, uh, then perhaps we shouldn't to change our design standards. So uh, what's it cost to change our design standards? An awful lot of money. An awful lot of money. It's not hundreds of millions, it's trillions. Trillions. And that's the problem all the countries face. And these things are being discussed, but at the moment, almost everywhere, the very arbitrary changes are being made. In England, for example, the... Uh, Nat uh, the uh, NRA, as it exists, the Environment Agency, follow on, um, uh, or predecessor, I'm sorry, uh, they have uh, decided, oh, well, we'll increase rainfall by 20% um, in this model so we can lean a little way towards climate change. And then they come along and change it again. It's very ad hoc. I don't like it. Uh, the engineers that gave the advice to do it said it was okay, but that's fine. There's just uh, you know, different ways of dealing with it. Um, and it's the same uh, issue all around the world. Do we do something now or do we wait? Uh, do we have enough information? Um, is it predictable? Um, what do we do now is the question. The poor old politician is in an unwinnable position because um, if you listen to IPCC, then to be political and very green, you have to say, oh, it's very bad, we're going to do this and change this and change that. Wait until you go to a politician and say, I need five billion pounds just to change the drainage of Leeds. Then it'll be rather interesting. Or any other city in the world. And this is the infrastructure spend that's a consequence. It's lying, lurking there. Um, the urban impact is going to be very, very serious. Very, very serious. Um, the expectation currently is that this will show uh, by 2035. This is a graph that all civil engineers work with. I've shown this one. This is America. This is Boulder in Colorado. Um, these are different uh, predictions, these different lines on a curve. If you look at the bottom, it's return period. That means uh, something that's on average will come once in 10 years. Once in 10 years could be certain design criteria inside an urban area, small town. Um, pipe design, a small weir, small infrastructure. One in a hundred is big infrastructure. Three-story high pump um, that you don't see. Uh, the water supply for Manchester um, is dependent every few years on some giant pumps being switched on to bring water across the Shap, which is a high point from north, the northern Lake District. 
every time you switch the pumps on, there's a penalty cost nearly £100,000 to pay because you have to have the generating capacity available all the time, even when you don't need it. So those people in Manchester don't know that. They don't care. They just need water to come out of their tap. But the design of those systems are getting more risky, not less risky, um, due to these changes. And this is what I mean by infrastructure. The variability here is massive. If you look at those two lines with the question marks here, it shows you the horizontal line across a spread of about 40 years, 50 years in return period. Now, uh, let me give you an example. The, the, the Thames in London um, has a barrage. That barrage is designed to a level of, uh, to be safe, once in 1,000 years. If something happens greater than that, uh, it will fail. It will fail. It will be overtopped. Uh, would the barrage itself fail? Probably not, but all the embankments along the whole of the Thames, all the way down to the sea, are built to defend at the same risk level. Uh, if they're overtopped by the ocean, uh, the embankments will wash away. And I'll show you some pictures uh, in a minute or two. Let me show you about rainfall. This is a radar. It sends out an electromagnetic signal at a particular frequency. Uh, for those that are into that, it's uh, generally X-band, C-band, or S-band frequencies um, that we use for these weather radars. It goes out at the speed of light, bounces off something, uh, a missile or an airplane or a raindrop. In fact, billions of raindrops. And you can measure rainfall, where it is, what its rain rate is, um, at different resolutions. I started working with radars uh, in the very early 1970s. And our ability to measure rainfall was on a resolution in space of around 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers. It averaged out the variation in rain until it was next to useless. Now we can measure from radars uh, down to 7.5 meters, 7.5 meters. The technology is quite fundamentally leapt forward. And you can see the picture you see on your television from a network of radars showing the storm system moving uh, across the UK. This is what happens in Europe. 175 radars. Most are C-band. They're slightly expensive. Some are S-band. They are very expensive, very big. Some are Doppler, which gives you some velocity information about the movement of the raindrops without going into maths. And some are dual polarized radars. Now, this is a slightly old-fashioned slide. Almost all the radars in the UK now are dual polarized radars. They're like your sunglasses. They look at an electromagnetic wave being sent out that's um, polarized in the vertical and then the horizontal. And if you do that, you get a lot more information. You can tell whether you're looking at a raindrop or a melting snowflake or a lump of ice. It'll tell you that. It'll tell you whether you're looking at a building that's not moving or a, um, a hill that's not moving that the radar beam has reflected off. And you can use some funny mathematics to clean it all up and produce a wonderful picture. Now, the whole of the United States is going to have dual polarized radars. China is going to have dual polarized radars. Europe is moving uh, already towards having the entire European landmass covered by dual polarized radars. This picture I just want to show you. This is uh, one I built, in fact, in 1991. Why did I build it? Well, I couldn't buy one. Uh, I couldn't buy one from anybody, and I knew I could build one, so I built one. And I stuck it outside Manchester, and I looked out, and then it saw different things than the big Met Office radar saw. Um, it saw rain coming in, but it showed far more detail because my radar beam was operating at 50 meter resolution, and the Met Office radar beam at that point in time was working at a five kilometer resolution. Um, and my beam was lower than the Met Office beam over the city. So I was able to take this data and put it into mathematical models of all the big pipes and storages within that city and predict flow within the city and control that infrastructure in real time. That's heavy mathematics and heavy real time programming. That's why people like me had to talk to computer scientists and work at the sharp end of computer science. And electrical engineers that specialize in control engineering. 
You had to get out of the silo that often we create with our subjects. I'm a civil engineer, I live in the box. I'm an electrical engineer, I don't talk to a civil engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer, I don't talk to either of them. That has been a tendency with almost all specializations in universities for very many years. And not many universities, frankly, have moved completely in this direction. Interestingly, Cambridge has, um, and Swansea has. Uh, how did I get Swansea to move? Well, I had the wonderful ability to sack all the heads of the department. Um, and then it changed. We didn't have departments, therefore we had a huge college. And I promised them that I would increase the staff, and I but was able to double the staff. Suddenly you have a huge engineering college. If I needed to appoint a chemist, or they needed, my colleagues said, I want a chemist to work in nano engineering. I could, they could, I'd back it. A physicist, yes, you can have him. Your interdisciplinary teams were not conflicted by the silo mentality. That was very, very important. And it's also important in dealing with the climate. You'll have all come across the work of Lorentz, the famous story about the butterfly flapping his wings somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, and a few months later you've got a giant storm in the uh, Atlantic Ocean and this ripple effect. Um, it's a lovely story, I love telling it. Whether it's true or not, I haven't the faintest idea. But the most important thing is that we never really know the true state of a dynamic system. A huge system like weather, we never completely know uh, what actually is going on. We know certain things at certain scales, both in time and space, but we don't know everything. And the problem for us then is in our predictions. And what can we do to deal with this? Well, we can predict very many times by changing starting conditions. And this is known as ensembles. And I'll show you that in a minute in terms of what we're able to do. This is a Met Office slide. It's a lovely slide. They're brilliant at predicting large scale. It's a, we have, we're lucky, we have an extraordinary good meteorological office. I would say one of the top two in the world, and at times the top one in the world. And its comp competition is the Americans, spend a lot more money. Um, our Met Office is of the size and scale that it is um, because of the history of the Royal Navy, would you believe? Um, but the reality is, it's a very good Met service uh, and stands us in good stead. But synoptic scale is predictable in short range very well. Mesoscale, that's a limited predictability. Numerical weather models that give you all the predictions on the television, um, they use NWP models. And I'll talk a little bit about scale as I move towards the end of my comments here. And fine scale, we have low predictability. Um, thunderstorms generating, uh, moving in on London, and then disappearing is a headache. It's very, very difficult to predict them. And if they happen to hit a sensitive catchment, you have disastrous flooding in London, and they may only have lived for 20 minutes or 25 minutes. So the variability at fine scale is vast, and the predictability is low. That's Boss Castle. You remember Boss Castle and helicopters saving people? You see cars in the middle of that, about 40 or 50 cars. There were about 20 cars, I think, went into the ocean. And in the days following that disaster, um, divers were going down to see if anybody happened to be in their cars. And they weren't. Uh, the cars were swept well offshore uh, down the river. This was a flash flood, a small flood. But it happened before in this circumstance literally at Boss Castle. This is a picture, two pictures. The one on the left is radar. That's measuring it in real time, a radar device. In fact, it was a C-band radar and a meteorological office radar. I had to be watching this in real time the day it happened. What no one tells you is there was another rain cell that didn't come in on Devon, but hit Wales, South Wales. And it went right up over South Wales without hitting any sensitive catchments. And it was a worse rain cell than the one that hit Devon. And it rained out on the Black Mountains. And there was no flood, uh, because if it had been a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, uh, we may have had a problem. Two rivers flow through Cardiff, the capital of Wales. They are both very fast response rivers. If it had hit the catchment of either of those rivers, that particular storm could have flooded the central part of the city of the capital of Wales. 
Um, the picture on the right is purely a numerical model. And it's a different scale, so you can't just unfortunately pick one up and put it on the other. But just look at the pattern. The numerical weather ability that we had in 2004 was starting to show itself as being pretty good, pretty good. And nowadays is even better. But it's still not the complete answer. The Thames, we have a barrier. Uh, it costs us an awful lot of money. To rebuild it may cost many billions. And we've talked about having to rebuild it. The question is when, not whether we will. Um, the when may be 10 or 20 years' time. And where? A long way downstream. A long way downstream. It would be much bigger and much more expensive. Many, many billions. The alternative is let London flood. Seems a good idea to me. I don't live there. <laughs> but why are we protecting it? Well, the big storms that are coming in from the Atlantic Ocean, which we expect to get worse, uh, this shows you predictions of surge height. The red is bad news, and the red comes down the east coast of our country, and all the rivers on the east coast have a problem, but I can say that rivers on the west coast also have a problem. Again, about uh, 15 to 20 years ago, I did a study for, in secret at that time for the Environment Agency, and it was all estuaries in England and Wales. And it was a climate change an extremist study. And uh, you see a, a whole number of cities having big problems on the west coast as well as the east coast. Uh, Bristol, Cardiff, Newport, Chepstow. Um, you have two meter surges currently, two meter high surges. Uh, for uh, people on the seven, that's two meter surge on top of a 15 meter tide, right? Second highest tide in the world. How close has Bristol come to actually going underwater in the center? About six inches is the answer, about six inches. Uh, why? Well, when you go around Bristol streets, you're not necessarily walking across a road, you're walking across the top of a canals, canalized river. Rivers flow under, they've been put under, under the roads. Um, if you walk down the central high street of Cheltenham, there's a river there, not, not dirt and ground, it's a river. And that river comes from a dam upstream. Um, and uh, with climate change, it is very easy to envisage uh, a problem at that dam and a problem with the center of, Chel of Cheltenham. But it's the same problem for very many places around the country. Any coastal um, city uh, will have increased problems to worry about. Now, what do we have to do? Well, we may have to build lots of uh, barriers. Uh, to keep Bristol dry, we definitely have to build a barrier. It's just a question of when. Cardiff is okay, they've already got one. Newport, we have to build a barrier. Chepstow, we have to build a barrier um, to protect the Somerset levels or walk, well, we could walk away and leave them and they go back to what they were like when King Alfred was there being chased by the Vikings. Um, but you need to protect them with a barrier. Um, these are the facts. Now, these are not cheap barriers. They're um, several billion to build. And if you don't do them, then you have to live with the consequences of not doing them, not building them. Um, you remember from uh, this particular storm, uh, a storm like this caused the floods in 1953. It's where the storm is, how strong the storm is, how big the storm is, how deep the low pressure is, how big the velocities are of this storm, and what fetch, what length of ocean is this uh, weather going over. For those of you who remember Katrina, the storm Katrina, Britain got started to worry about things. Now, we don't have um, hurricanes. Well, we get the leftover bits that get over. Um, sometimes those leftover bits are quite big. Uh, Liverpool in 1703 got a very big chunk of leftover hurricane that uh, put 400 ships, over 400 ships, to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and Liverpool had a really bad time, 1703. Um, after Katrina, the government panicked a little bit about, my God, what will happen with us? So I formed a group to do some sneaky work 
It's the only way to describe it. It's supposed to be in confidence at the Met Office. I'm talking about 40 researchers around the country from a variety of universities with certain expertise. And we took a storm, a real storm, and we put it inside a numerical weather model, a very precise and a sophisticated numerical model at the Met Office running on their supercomputer. And without going into the maths, we turned the volume of that storm up. And we made it roughly once in 1,000 years. And then we played that storm onto Great Britain and the North Sea. And what happened, of course, was uh, this. Uh, we did it 50 different times with, fi with 50 sets of different starting conditions, um, all equally likely. And this is the way we tackle uncertainty at the moment. We change the, the first model, which is the atmospheric science, feed that into hydrology, feed it into hydraulics, feed it into flooding and distributing models within a city. Many, many models, all very sophisticated, none of which existed when I was a young student. None of which existed. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do any of it. Now we can. Um, now, this is just two. If you look at the one on the left and the one on the right, it's exactly the same storm, but it's two different ensembles, two different possibilities created by fiddling the starting conditions um, in physics for these storms in a big numerical weather model. And the little blue line at the top of the picture is a nice one. Um, that shows you where the center of the storm went. On the left, it went round in a bit of a circle. Did it cause a problem? No, it didn't. So that ensemble, that particular uh, individual, one out of 50, caused no problems. The one next to it did, because it actually went up the English Channel. There's a glitch in my, my slide that stopped it going, I'm sorry. But it went up the English Channel, and it crept around the corner, and it caused uh, chaos uh, in London. That's a real storm. Now, if we take the numerical model and feed the data from that atmospheric science into the hydraulics or the hydrology, we can get this. And that big red storm I just showed you, this is the River Thames. This is a quite sophisticated hydraulic model taking the surge that's come down the North Sea that's been modeled from the atmosphere, and it's coming up the seven. The blue bit is quite interesting because that's what happens. The line in the middle of the picture is actually the Thames barrier. The lowest part of London that's problematic is the city of London, which is just upstream. Um, this particular event was one in a thousand years or just higher. What happened? Well, London flooded. Uh, what does that mean? 35 billion pounds in damage at minimum, that's physical damage, and a collapse in the world stock markets, right? Which is really annoying uh, because I have a lot of shares um, and I would be totally devastated. Now, at the same time as you close the barrier to try and protect the city from the incoming surge, the storm, the storm is raining upstream. It's a big enough weather system to rain, and it fills upstream because you've closed the barrier, the water can't get out. All the fresh water is piling up behind um, uh, the barrier, and so you hope you can lower the barrier when the tide goes out. That's all you've got. So this management of timing is quite crucial. This is why the infrastructure is quite important. When we move that barrier um, somewhere down at the bottom of the estuary, uh, Lord knows what the cost is going to be. 10, 20, 30 billion pounds. So the infrastructure implication of some of these uh, uncertainties that we're dealing with is massive. It's seriously massive. Um, what, me what does it mean to uh, the river? This is Woolwich. I put this picture up because two things. First of all, I had two people watching me uh, when, who were present during this uh, exercise, which was uh, done uh, for crisis management of, this, of, the, of London. Um, one was the policeman in charge of all crisis management within London, a, a superintendent. And he was uh, on one side. And the other was a lady who was the chief executive of Woolwich Borough Council. And she watched Woolwich going underwater. It's a bit like Holland. If you walk along the embankment, you look down. And so the minute you overtop the embankment, it's a question of how long will it be there before it washes away? And it would wash away. Um, and then the problem then is that it gets very deep, very quickly, and high velocity water, human beings running out to save themselves, they drown. Because high velocity water knocks them over if the water's about knee level. 
They can't stand up. Why did we know this? Because the wonderful Japanese have done experiments with real people in hydraulic tanks and knocked them down. I must say they invited me to go in a hydraulic tank, <laughs> and I did refuse, uh, graciously. Uh, the only safe place on this picture to be in such a crisis situation is uh, Her Majesty's prison in Woolwich. And the only advice I can give you is to hit a policeman and say, please arrest me now um, and put me away um, and you're safe. This is all mathematically modeled. We could not do this when I was a young engineer. So imagine the models that we're running here. A huge half across the Atlantic numerical model of the atmosphere. Uh, a very high resolution model of a regional model of the North Sea a surge prediction model that's hydraulics going up the river, and then all the control of the gates opening and closing on the barrage, and the water coming into the river upstream. It's a cascade of models. All the uncertainty from each model is affecting all the other models. It's very hairy, and it's very expensive if you use uh, these results on infrastructure change. When do we do infrastructure change? How long do we wait? What do we do first? At the moment, these are basically ignored. Um, quickly, uh, ocean. You all know that our railways are not safe in the south. They wash away every now and again. Um, this is um, a storm. Uh, what models did we run? Well, this is an interesting center picture. One is a continental wave model, halfway, a well, long way out into the Atlantic Ocean. The little red box there is a regional model called Polcoms. Its grid size is 1.8 kilometer. The WAM model, continental wave model, puts data in. This is a big model that's fed from atmospheric models. It goes into the regional model, Polcoms. It goes into a local coastal zone model, which this particular model is many of them, called Coast 2D. From this, uh, other calculations are done in different models, surge predictors wave predictors. Why do we do that? Well, because we want to, want to build uh, embankments uh, on the coastline to stop uh, waves crashing over and flooding uh, coastal low spots, and therefore we have to be able to predict and calculate how safe those embankments are. You've heard about the Seven Tidal Barrage. It's uh, envisaged between Barry and Western Supermare. It's been turned down, I think, uh, seven times since 1880. It's, it's, it's going to be built. It's illogical not to do it. Um, this is uh, two models. Uh, the one on the left is without a barrage, a very high velocity, it's quite dangerous, um, and very dirty because fine sediment is up. It looks a dirty sea in the seven. Uh, when you build a barrage, it becomes uh, low velocity and it looks like the Mediterranean. Uh, that's what the mathematical models say. Um, but you can generate electricity about roughly between 5% and 7%, depending on whether you do it properly, um, of total energy current requirements of this country. Um, and uh, that's if you expand it to include um, the rivers coming out of the um, Somerset area. Um, but if you design that, some of the design studies are, will it stand up to the big waves that will be generated by future storms coming in the uh, Seven Estuary and from the, uh, the, whole of the, the, uh, the whole of the sea that is directly facing America? There's nothing between uh, you and America. And these are some of the predictions you can do with these cascades of models, one model feeding data into another model, generating uncertainty at the beginning and feeding it through all the other models. And that's where we are currently uh, operating and trying to do this. This is, in fact, three places on the North Sea coast, Whitby in Yorkshire, down to Sheerness, which is the seven. And this is a prediction at a point in time. And using 50 storm estimates, ensembles that are equally likely, uh, you have that sort of spread at this point in time. That's the degree of uncertainty that the atmospheric modeling is conveying down to the hydraulic or the ocean modeling um, at this particular site. Um, these are two other things. This is wave height at a water depth. Uh, that is also important for designing structures. Gates, uh, the loading on gates, um, embankment design. If you make an embankment too big, it costs you millions and millions and millions of pounds uh, more than you need spend. So it's quite crucial and very, very expensive. The wave direction is crucial. Um, and you can see the sort of variability that it conveys on wave direction. 
like total variability. It says, not far into the future, we haven't the faintest idea. Finish off, Bolton. Um, this is the strategic sewer system. Really boring, but it's a big sewer system for a quarter of a million people. These are huge pipes. And the, the three little light blue things are tanks. And the tanks are that big. They're, they're holes about 150 feet deep, um, uh, well over 100 feet, 120 feet across. And the problem here is, uh, if I have a storm, and uh, if uh, there's so much water in the system from draining the steep hills around Bolton, full of sewage and pollution, uh, do I let it go into the river, which means the Irwell, which means all the way down through central Manchester and all the way down to Warrington and into the, the, the sea, the Irish Sea? Or can I control it by storing it temporarily? When do I let it into my storage? Which storage? How quickly? How long do I keep it? When do I let it out? How quickly do I let it out? All the control mathematics for that is actually kind of intriguing. It's highly nonlinear, highly distributed, and it's nasty control engineering. But this was done 30 years ago. 30 years ago. But the modeling of weather and hydrology and hydraulics wasn't as good 30 years ago as it is now. And our big cities are going to become controlled cities. They're going to be moving in the area of quite sophisticated control, not passive control, which is what we've done since the Victorian era. A major change. And what you can do is turn little green picture here, very high flow, into uh, the orange flow. Basically reduce it down to almost nothing um, by smart real-time control. Dare I say it, AI systems that learn from data that comes in in real time. These were talked about back in the very early 90s. Uh, so there's nothing new, I think, um, uh, on uh, our scope here. If it gets free, this is Pennsylvania in, uh, I think, 1910 or thereabouts. Um, this is actually water that's out of the pipes and coming through the streets. That's what an urban flood looks like if it's bad. Some Chinese cities along the Yangtze have this problem. Wuhan, huge city, mega city, has this problem. Um, Another city, Dongguan. Dongguan is one of the chip capitals of China, which means of the world. And the chip factories, costing billions, are one after the other along the side of the Yangtze, behind embankments. Um, if the embankment control systems fail, or the embankments are overtopped, um, don't have your shares in chips, um, because there's going to be a problem and a shortage. The last penultimate slide, and I'll shut up. I put this up to show you uh, how much I like floods, really, as an engineer, because it's employed me for the last 40 years. Um, this is the lower seven, July the 20th, 2007. July the 20th is my birthday. I just thought I'd mention that. And if you look at the little sign below, Tewkesbury Water Festival, <laughs> and this is the center of Tewkesbury on July the 20th, 2007. If you remember, several hundred thousand people had no electricity. Why didn't they have any electricity? Well, because the electricity companies had said, when we put in our electricity huge giant substations, we'll put it on ground that was not flooded in 1947. They didn't employ any hydrologists. There were no water engineers employed. They were wonderful electrical engineers, but they were idiots as hydrologists. And the 2007 flood was worse than the 1947 flood down here. Um, that's just how we move forward as human beings. Uh, we're not always perfect. The electrical engineers put it on a hill that said, if 47 happens again, we're OK. That's OK. It'll be all right. 2007, it wasn't. 2007 failure was much worse than the failure rate risk level uh, in 1947. So my conclusions are these. We, we live in an uncertain world. We always have. We've always designed for risk and uncertainty. But often, as uh, ordinary citizens, we don't worry too much about our dams and our sluices and our pumps and our pipes. In a city, they're generally out of sight and out of mind. And I'm talking big things, not little pipes, big pipes. Pipes you can drive your car through. Um, 
That's big infrastructure. And once you've built your city, it's very, very expensive to dig it up again. China has a huge problem looming its way in perhaps another two decades, particularly in South China. Severity and frequency of urban flooding in particular and drought is going to increase in future. Our dams for water supply in this country have always been designed to fail on average once every 50 years. But once every 50 years is becoming once every 40 years. When do we go out and do something about that? We have thousands of dams. A third of the cost of a dam is a spillway, roughly. Uh, our dams cost 100 million, 150 million. Uh, we have huge issues for water supply. Uh, where's the big issue? Unfortunately, where you are, uh, southeast of England. Uh, it shouldn't be where you are, but London consumes water from your area. Water comes down to London and water comes up to London. And the solution is there, and it's been there since 1880, and that is uh, bring water in from Wales. Uh, but to do it properly. Unfortunately, privatised industries tend not to do it properly. They, they work on the mentality of, this is my patch, I deal with that. I don't worry about my country, which is slightly bigger. Um, so we have problems there. Um, I've mentioned this uh, RAE and CAE. I've, I, I'm afraid you've got a slide I used in uh, China recently. There's a big Newton program that's been funded by the UK government. And, uh, I've been involved a little bit in it. And in this country, the REE is dealing with the engineering side, or part of the engineering side of it. And in China, the Chinese Academy of Engineering is dealing with it. But we do this together, hand in hand. So UK and China are working on looking at their cities, their Londons, their Manchesters, their Liverpools, their Shanghais, their Wuhans, their Ningbos, huge cities. What do we do? Because we know we've got the same problems. And they're going to lead, this small amount of uh, feed money is going to lead to, I think, quite a large amount of funds going in across multidisciplinary research groups across countries. And at the end, it won't just be uh, China and the UK. I'm sure other countries will be brought in. And so my last comment is, being prepared is better than crisis management. Um, I don't want to leave on a, a desperately... Um, uh, uh, sort of um, a foot where it's depressing. It isn't depressing. Uh, the reality is um, we can often do almost all of this infrastructure within a time span uh, that is uh, completely uh, reasonable. We can build dams in three years, uh, typically, or less. Uh, very, very big dams, like barrages, would be perhaps five years. Um, and uh, the reality is that, that our cities will be the problem. Uh, for us, urban uh, development of large infrastructure within our big cities, that's going to be a headache. And what will happen is uh, we're going to have one or two disasters before we make a political move. Um, I've been dealing in the last few years with floods, floods, floods and floods. But I was a national water resource planner in this country back in 76, when 1976 had a drought and we were terrified of running out of water. If you remember, those that are old enough to remember. And um, the last drought that we got panicked about was 1932, 33, 34. And that still is the governing drought for almost all design. It roughly is once in 50 years, or at least it was. Um, and uh, it's time we had another big drought. So you're not going to just worry about floods. You'll worry about floods one year, and the following year you're going to run straight into a drought. China is much bigger than us, and uh, China has it both ways. They can have floods in one place and droughts in another. Um, and I've been there uh, when that's ac actually happened. So we live in this uncertain world, and uh, I think we need to recognize that the IPCC is not the end of this story. The story goes much further for us because the cost implications in our societies are absolutely huge, huge. And I've never seen a story in a newspaper uh, saying anything about more investment in our water supply reservoirs and transfer systems, or indeed um, about our city's drainage systems. It's not something you do. It's taken for granted. And I may say that's the same in almost every country. So uh, that, I think, is where I shall be quiet, Mr. Chum. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, and that was great. A real example of understanding the science to enable us to do the engineering, uh, to, say, to enable us to do something about it, rather than just wring our hands, which seems absolutely excellent. Who would like to ask a question? Sir. Thank you very, thank, thank you very much. Um, very, I'm over, over here, actually. Hello. Um, yeah, extremely infor informative, but you were sort of saying um, that uh, we could spend a lot of money or we perhaps we don't want to spend it so quickly. Can you give me a sense of whether you think we're spending enough money in the UK now? The, I think the problem for everybody is, is this big decision about should we start to react at this time. The IPCC is doing its thing. And every few years, you're going to get a couple of years or so, you'll get an IPC report which will update what it's already said and perhaps take it a bit further. So the science, now the science is not being done by IPCC. It's the world's universities working together, groups, research institutes, and so on. Um, so it's got better and better and better at it. So that, I think, is going ahead very well. And that is having an implication on the politics. But the politicians don't really know uh, or think about the, the, the engineering consequences of all of this. Uh, they haven't really thought about the cost consequences of it um, at all. Uh, and going beyond IPCC has been very arbitrary to date. Uh, I mentioned in, in this country, uh, some of the uh, urban flooding designs have been uh, modified by uh, the Environment Agency in England uh, and Wales, uh, Natural Resources Wales, they, they kind of copy a little bit. Uh, CEPA in Scotland has done it slightly differently. Um, but what they've done is they've um, been fairly arbitrary in how they address things. Um, you know, you could change a standard now and make it more stringent to cope with something you think may happen in the future. Um, the problem is, are you wasting your money or do we really know yet? Uh, it's that dealing with that degree of uncertainty is actually quite problematic. Uh, my view with little pipes is it's uh, too soon to muck about very much. It's the big infrastructure that I worry about. Um, and I don't think we're getting that right um, because uh, we, we have... In, in, now, it depends on where you are. In China, I think they have a better chance of getting it right because I happen to know an awful lot about how things are going on the water si side in China. I don't think it's going very well in Britain because we have a privatised water sector. Um, and the criticism about that is that um, you, have in camp you have silos. You have a silo mentality that if you live in the Thames region, Thames water is looking at Thames water. Um, where can they get water? Well, they tried to get a reservoir designed through public inquiry, which was really stupid, in my view. I'm speaking very plain. A very shallow reservoir formed in Oxfordshire on prime farmland, uh, and shallow reservoirs will undoubtedly uh, suffer from problems of algal pollution because sunlight will penetrate and you'll get algae problems and taste and odor and all sorts of issues with the water. You build large water storage economically where you have a mountain and a valley and lots of rain. And that's not in Oxfordshire. Uh, you're not gonna get away with doing extraordinary things in the English Lake District. And you can't afford to transfer, transfer water across the Pennines uh, because water is incompressible and heavy. So you have a north-south route on both the left and the right side of the Pennines, as indeed you have a problem with the Northern Lake District and the Southern Lake District. The big thing that I think personally we should have done by now, um, and all of the design of this was worked out a long time ago in detail in the UK, before water privatization took place, uh, was that London needs water from Mid Wales. The system that would provide it is about 15 different dams. It's not just one dam. It's about 15 different dams with one giant dam that would be the biggest man-made dam in Europe. And that would relieve water having to come down the east coast from as far up as Grimsby uh, to be consumed by Londoners or up from the south coast, southern water region, uh, to feed London. Uh, London needs Welsh water. It's that simple. Um, but that's not going to get done properly 
my private eyes. I can't see it happening. I watch what they do. Uh, I find their suggestions half-baked. Uh, I'm being, because I'm retired and can't be sacked, I find it's a wonderful um, freedom to be able to say what you really think, which for many years I was so careful at being choosing my words. But I'm afraid for dealing with these big problems, privatized sectors fall over, fall over. Water's quite vital. No water, dead people. Um, or no development, no uh, you know, industry if you don't have water. So you've got to do that right. And uh, that means large-scale investment at times, and that's not happening in Britain. Um, we have a scheme for London at the moment, which is completely half-baked, which is a cut-down version of what was proposed back in the 1970s when there was natural, national water resource planning. Well, I don't a see... terrifying picture you're painting, Ian. I'm afraid so. <laughs> I'm but... going to let one or two people come in. Uh, sir. Hi. Um, I, I was very bothered right at the beginning of your talk with the uh, telegraph picture of, of the um, archipelago of <laughs> England. Yeah. Uh, I'm particularly worried because I live, as it happens, 56 feet above sea level, and I make that rather a lot more than seven metres, and yet the whole of the eastern side of the country was flooded in that picture, and that seems to me a sort of misinformation which we need to avoid when dealing with this sort of sensitive issue. Yeah. I mean, that was a newspaper picture and fairly crudely drawn, just to make a point. But the, the difficulty we've got, I think, is that uh, the ocean is expanded as it gets hotter. So the ocean's getting a little bit higher anyway. Um, and that's a, a problem, and, a, 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 and it helps solve the problem. I mean, the deeper water actually makes it slightly more difficult for nature to create a larger surge, interestingly. Um, so there's a bit of a balancing act going on there. But the big problem for us is all the evidence um, on the research groups around the world working towards uh, commentaries to supply IPCC and others in the literature is that uh, the glaciers are in general retreat. That's uh, fresh water on land. And so where's it going? Ocean, which means ocean could get deeper. Are they, going, are they looking like being uh, glaciers again? No, they're not. Uh, they look as though they really are pulling back in lots of places, lots of places. The evidence is scary, actually. Um, now, about the uh, water on land, uh, the first thing to go will be Greenland, if it's going to go. Right? If you were really uh, look down on things, you'd think, my God, if Greenland melts, we're in real trouble. All the newspaper article did was br brought people's attention to the fact that all the ice on Greenland is standing on land. When it, if it melts, or even a proportion of it, it will add depth to the sea. So you may keep your feet dry, Steve, but lots of other people won't. Uh, question there, sir, please. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Uh, do you think that our town and country planning system should be much tightened up to restrict where local planning authorities give permission for new buildings? Uh, or maybe you think that they should go on giving such permissions, but building design should change much more quickly uh, to give us defences. You're baiting me. Um, no, I don't. I think it's not fit for purpose. I, I've been very critical of it for years. I've been very critical of the building regulations for years. Uh, if you remember a few years ago when we had a deputy prime minister, I think it was uh, Prescott, and he was uh, pushing forward the big housing development on the Thames Corridor. I can't remember the official name, but it's a lot of housing. There's no reason in principle why you couldn't do it. Um, but you would have to change the building regs that if you actually build appropriate uh, designed properties in flood-prone areas, I don't object to it. But if you try and build buildings under the current building regulations, it's stupid. Now, um, I've actually helped uh, people for nothing um, uh, that have survived several floods around Tewkesbury, um, parish council, people that are lost in the middle of the bureaucratic nightmare that it is to um, try and stop builders building in stupid places. Uh, and I was at a public inquiry. I was first of all banned, interestingly, which is very interesting at this age, to be banned from going to a, a local authority. I had a legal letter saying you're not allowed to come because I didn't live in the area. I've been asked by the local people to come and hold their hand. Um, and that was because I obviously knew too much. 
and if I said it, I was going to cause a problem. The, the house builders do two things. The thing that should be, they, they buy land cheap, which is farmland. Uh, they do a deal with the farmer. This is a standard practice, I may say, in uh, areas next to flooding. Um, and uh, if they manage to get planning permission, the farmer will get a lot of money, not just the, the rate for a farm, farmland, which is cheap. This is price per acre. And then they'll go in and try and get planning permission, and they'll employ a very expensive lawyer who knows exactly what to do with the planning laws and will drive it through. And the planning laws are like boxes you tick. At times, you feel there's no common sense. It's someone lost in, in a quagmire of ticking boxes. Did you ask the environment agency? Yes. Did you do this? Yes. It's, it's really absolutely and totally inappropriate. There's one and a half thousand houses going to be built across the road from where the 2007 flood came. I guarantee to you, the road is going to go underwater, the houses are going to go underwater, there is no way out because you're on a, uh, basically a peninsula. And who's going to live there? Young families. How deep is the water that they'd have to wade through? Meters. So they have to all learn to swim rather rapidly. And that's been passed because all the boxes were ticked. So, uh, without going through other things, I have many examples. I do not think the current planning regulations make any sense to me at all in areas prone to flooding, and I do not think the building regulations make any sense to me whatsoever. Uh, you could develop property uh, in a sensible way uh, with different building regs, and for some reason, uh, the government will not go near it. And that's uh, multiple parties. I'm not going to say Labour or Conservative or anything. Both parties won't go near it. And for the life of me, I don't know why. It seems to me pretty damned obvious, um, but not to the politicians. Well, I have to say, I think uh, that's really cheered us up, Ian. But uh, whilst I don't normally think of CSR as a hotbed of revolution and ferment, um, do you know, what we have seen is that there's a lot known that's not being applied. Hmm. Uh, and I think we could all uh, dig in to what is already known about hydrology uh, and uh, understand what's going to happen in places. I, I won't take up the political aspect of this, but are fascinating to give us the tools, Ian, hmm. that we can look at these things in more detail and perhaps invade the places where people don't want us to be, which is always agreeable. Um, can I thank you for giving a super example in a rather different way to we're used to of how uh, the science might be applied to very important ends. Uh, I'm sure people will want to have a quick word and just check that their house is okay. Thank you all very much.